Something else I want to show you. It's right here on the table. Right here. Look what we have. You know this, don't you? What is it? The big yellow box with the big blue letters on it? Food content is anything food related to, to fill the social media pipeline. An endless desire for new stuff. A cake this moist could only be from scratch. The Golden Flakes and adds a secret frosting. Print publishing has been transitioning into digital. Not everyone subscribes to the print issue, but everyone is going to go online and look for recipes. Food videos are all over the internet. Photography, radio shows, it, it's media and it talks about food. The thing about food is that it's a way just kind of to bring people together and just to, to talk and hang out and laugh and bullshit. When I first started out, again, this was like 2006, I thought, okay, the way that you get a job working in food media is you get your education in writing and journalism, whatever, and then you go to culinary school. That, that, that to me, my type A brain was you do that, you do that, plus this, here's your job. When I first got to New York and was working at Sever, I found out that no one had gone to culinary school. It was mostly people who were, again, good at writing, good at editing who had eaten out a lot or just had been in the food world and like their first job was, hey, cover this restaurant, so they did. So it was kind of like a trial by fire. You just like, learn, you get the experience as you go along. When I was uh, like a teenager, that's when food television, celebrity chefs became more of a bigger deal. It wasn't just Jacques and Julia on PBS anymore. You know, you had a whole network devoted to food. Restaurants became a bigger deal. The culinary industry exploded. My first job was at NBC as a page. The media landscape was totally different a decade ago. If you had a $10 million budget, it used to go to 10 outlets, and now it's got to go to 100 outlets. So it's literally just divvying up your budget differently. In the past, we had broadcast television. Most people had two or three channels, and a commercial would be put on the air, and everybody watching that channel around the country would see that ad. That's not the case anymore. We have hundreds of channels, and virtually no one sits in front of the television and watches television as it's happening. Unless, of course, it's the Super Bowl, or the Academy Awards, or the World Series, and those are exceptions to the rule. I started in 2008, and then there were the big glossy publications, and then there were some, some online startups. And uh, the New York Times was like the big food section, and Florence Fabricant was the big reporter, and then you had Food and Wine, and Bon Appetit, and Sever, and they were major players. And now the playing field has kind of leveled out a bit, where the online startups aren't so scrappy anymore. And I think the bigger, more traditional publications are kind of learning from the upstarts. I started as an assistant to a, a lot of like food stylists that have done it for a really long time. And and so I think I remember from those shoots that, um, that like everything had its place, you know, like meat cut in perfect slices, like you have the perfect bite on a fork. It's, it's you know, really fussy. Food is fun again and like that's, it's, it, Part of that makes it more approachable to more people. In addition to the sort of democratization of images where you get onto Instagram and everyone thinks they're a photographer, combine these two things and you have this explosion of, you know, what we're calling now food media. What's a foodie? A foodie? <laughs> I don't know. I think that foodie is such a like dirty word now in like the food industry. People are just like, ugh. <laughs> a foodie. Um, a foodie is just a poser. It's kind of like the new gourmand kind of uh, term, where it's just someone who gives a shit about what they eat. They care about uh, where the food comes from. They're, they're into it more than your average person. People eat, call me a foodie. You know, like, I don't really necessarily, it is kind of, it feels like a dirty, a dirty word. And like, I don't necessarily want to be associated as like a foodie. A self-professed expert in, in nonsense. I mean, 
There are real foodies, like some of these people behind who actually are studied in food, they know food very well, and they're great at it, and they're subject matter experts. Then there's all these other people who just go to the hottest restaurants, like, oh, I'm really into all this stuff. I actually don't want to eat it, but I'm gonna eat it on camera. And it's just kind of like, I don't know, it's a little bit of a gaggy word, to be honest. I think it's kind of jumped the shark. Foodie is a weird term that, like, nerds gave themselves, and I just, I don't... Oh, God. So, I don't know, I guess it's just someone who, like, doesn't eat Soylent for every meal. Like, I don't know. I think it's kind of the same realm as calling someone like a fashionista or someone who's just like into fashion more. It's not their job really per se, it's just... Their hobby. Whether that's going out and finding the best place to eat it, or it's making it and having dinner parties for their friends and family. You know, if you're really into food and passionate about it, I think, does that make does that make you a foodie? I don't, I don't know, maybe, probably, I guess, I guess so. You know, what is a foodie? I, I you know, I, I think it's everybody, anybody, you know, if you want to be. A foodie is like, you're right, I hate the way it sounds. I know. <laughs> I need to hear it. I think that, I think a foodie is someone, it is like hand in hand with like Yelp culture, I think. Yeah. Don't you think? It's like someone that, that has, that, I, no, I don't fucking know, I don't have an answer. Um, I think that there's sort of a foodie snob level going around, but not not for Virginia foodie. If you love it and you're interested in it, then you're part of us. So many people now are self-proclaimed foodies. People have referred to me as a, as a foodie. Um, I, I don't like it. <laughs> um, I have no qualms if someone wants to call themselves a foodie. Um, I refer to myself and other people who are like really like constantly thinking about food or in food um, as food heads just because um, always thinking about it. People who just um, would rather eat at an Olive Garden over McDonald's call themselves a foodie because they think that they are, you know, they care about food when actually they really don't. They just like, oh, I like to eat delicious things. Well, everyone does. That doesn't mean you're a foodie. It's funny, foodie is one of the maligned words here at Eater. Like when you join, there's a 101 sheet about everything and like you can't use the word foodie. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily fair or not, but it's someone who's obsessed with food. We like to use restaurant obsessives or food obsessives because it sounds less twee and precious and less like someone who's gonna Instagram every single meal that they have. So I think it depends on if you're looking at the good side or the bad side of the word foodie. My name is Nick Sharma. I am a food writer and a photographer. I also write for the San Francisco Chronicle, um, and I'm also a blogger. A Brown Table is a blog that I started when I lived in DC a couple of years ago. It was a way for me to chronicle what I was cooking at home, but also a way for me to kind of represent um, people like me, who were people of color, um, and also who were queer. And I got to do that in the blog because that was an unregulated uh, form of media at that time. And that's how A Brown Table was born. My name is Jarell Guy and I am a creator. I write, I shoot, and I style everything that goes on the blog and on Instagram. In terms of my Instagram, I think I'm just celebrating how beautiful and vibrant food is, kind of inspire people to, to think differently about eating better. I felt moved when I would see beautiful things, you know, and I wanted to be able to create that same feeling in other people because it's such a, it's such a intense, you know? Social media has played a role in um, the success of the blog because I think specifically Instagram, the way that it started was people were just sharing like pretty pictures, you know, and that was their art. There was this intersection between art and food that happened for the first time in this casual way, you know what I mean? Like, um, like there, there were people that posted like, oh, this is my lunch, but then there were people that, you know, really took that visual seriously, you know, and, and, and grab people's attention. I think if you could just find a style and, and, and a unique voice in that space, then people will listen to you. It just provided that opportunity for me to, to like showcase, showcase my style. I know that 
it's the reason why everything has happened. It's the reason why you're here, you know? Like, it's the reason why I have a cookbook, you know? Because I had a platform to speak. Social media changed the game in food media. Just removed all the barriers. It made the gatekeepers, in my opinion, almost obsolete. It's kind of like marketing or sales. Like you are making sure the audience gets this story. Instagram, especially, you know, plays such a huge part. People are eating with their eyes now. They want to share the food that they're eating, especially if it's a really beautiful, presentable dish. They want to showcase that to their friends. So restaurants are taking that into account now. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, Instagram has definitely affected the way food is shot because, I mean, now, I mean, I'm not only when I shoot a recipe for our website, um, you want to get people to click on it. It needs to look good. And also, I mean, those that, you know, shot that I might take for the website will use for the Instagram to promote it. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I think that Instagram has definitely, you know, people are looking for, um, it's that certain aesthetic, you know, of like whether, whatever it might be, whether it's um, like a really close, like porny shot of something, you know, like the egg yolk dripping down or whatever. No one needs Bon Appetit, no one needs Savoir, no one needs any of these things to go out and be like, oh, I'm gonna go and I'm traveling to Australia and I'm gonna put my whole entire trip on Insta stories. And I think you're gonna see more and more of that in food media. I remember uh, someone told me when Instagram first came out, they were like, this should be thought of as a platform, not just like a fun app where you can share pictures, like this will be a publishing platform. And a lot of people, um, kind of laughed at that, and they were like, oh yeah, no way, that's just pictures. How can that be anything? How can it produce content? But now we're seeing like that's exactly, it's literally like a living app magazine that most people use. I have a cookbook, I have a blog, I have a YouTube channel, but social media is, aside from my newsletter, that's the main way I tell people about everything that I'm doing and make sure that I can sell books and I can do sponsored content and I can you know, continue doing this as a living. These are places where we can kind of, um, you know, weave in certain actions, you know, calls to action. We can weave in certain messages that might feel a little unexpected, but you're catching people a bit off guard. And I think those are really good moments to catch people because um, it sort of comes as a surprise. There's a, there's a constant pressure to be on social media, even for people that don't want to be on social media these days in, in the food business, because it's, the easiest way to get access to an audience that you never would otherwise. People should view it more as a tool or the means to an end rather than the end in and of itself. Sometimes I'll go out to eat and I'm like, damn it, it's so dark in here. I'm like, sometimes I'm like, oh, I really want the tail by the window so I get that, that good, good light, you know? <laughs> it's like the buffet. I mean, you know, you'll have your meat, your vegetable, your potato, and then your, your light station, you know, where that last stop, you know, put the dish there. And, you know, take your shot and then sit down and eat. <laughs> Why not? I was like working in the industry and was like seeing people do things in front of the camera. I was like, oh, I want to do that. So I thought maybe um, like a correspondent for the Today Show or something like that. I realized, oh, I don't have to do that anymore. So I don't have to move to a small market in the middle of like nowhere, Minneapolis or something. I can totally bypass that. I can shoot, host, edit videos and put it up on the internet. Oh, why, hello there. I'm Katie Q, and you're watching my YouTube channel, Q Katie. And there are so many more opportunities to actualize your, your dreams, I think, or at least my, what my specific dreams were and are. It's so much more accessible now than it was before this world existed. Hey, thanks for subscribing. I'll see you soon. Bye. If your content's good, if people like it, you will be successful. And if you keep up that content, you will have longevity in that success. It's really cool to me. The, the democracy of YouTube is kind of magical. I think about video production being more of a democracy now too, just because it's so accessible. Technically, according to television rules 20 years ago, I have no business having a cooking show and I can. We all remember the movie The Wizard of Oz, right? When Toto pulled back the curtain to reveal there was a man behind the curtain, right? Well, I'm Toto. I like to pull back the curtain 
on how media work and help young people better appreciate what goes into media making. If one of your friends all of a sudden is beginning to promote a product or a service, you need to be aware that they, they might be paid to promote it. I think the term influencer always comes with the business idea of it. It always comes with money. It always comes with the thought of brand deal kinds of stuff. It's like a self-professed celebrity. I, uh, I influence you. I, I, I influence everything you do. I mean, it's just fucking stupid is what an influencer is. Those used to be called editors. I am bringing you, editors or journalists, I am bringing you information that is useful or interesting that you want to consume. I mean, that is what, you know, publications did. If you're interested in food, you went to Sever, Food and Wine, all those magazines. Like, I am interested. This is an affinity of mine. So to just call you someone an influencer, to me, like, undercuts all of this body of work or, like, the talent that is really just underneath it, and then influencers just, boop, on top. If you don't know that they're being paid, that they are a paid uh, influencer, persuader, let's call it what it is, there are paid actors out there, and many people don't realize that they're paid. Instagram has allowed anyone from LeBron to whoever wants to be a foodie to be an influencer. Now, if you can actually sell product and you are valuable to a brand, that's influential. If you can sell a movement, if, if you've actually moved something because of your influence, then great. Kim Kardashian uses like, eats a new bag of potato chips and stores can't keep them in stock. Like, that worked. That's influence. Influencers used to be like, oh, here's like the hot spots to eat and like you're showing pictures. But now I feel like with, in terms of Instagram, at least for influencing, it's all about like that cheese pull and like pulling your sandwich open and like showing that like, you know, nice cross section of your sandwich, your bagel or whatever. I think that like now it's just like more like food porny, you know, for, for that kind of stuff for Instagram. Everybody wants acknowledgement. I mean, people want acknowledgement more than they want money. So there is this, Everybody still wants to be Instagram famous. Is the bubble gonna pop for them making money? I, yes, I don't think that many, there aren't that many people making money on it. Yes, everybody we know and we see, they're all making money, but we know them because of that. For every one person you know, there's one million people posting some garbage. I and mean, I, I see it all the time, like how could that person post that and think that looks good or what's the value? Like how much time are you spending on adding nothing to this world or your world? But people just love, you know, it's, it's a lonely world. HRN, or Heritage Radio Network, is a nonprofit food radio station. We are based in Bushwick, Brooklyn. We operate out of two shipping containers inside Roberta's Pizza. Radio and podcasts are super accessible. It's free. And um, in our case, we are online, and so all of our content is available anywhere in the world. Beyond that, radio is a really nice way to connect on a very emotional level in storytelling. Radio is beautiful for talking about food because it does leave something to the imagination. And you can interpret that differently. You know, if you're producing a radio show, you can just, um, you know, describe the dish and leave it at that. Or, you know, a lot of our shows you'll hear chewing and crunching and sipping. And, uh, you know, that's another nice way to add some depth to the radio show. Hello, internet. You are listening to a recommended reading with Food Book Fair on heritageradionetwork.org. I am one of the co-directors of Food Book Fair, as well as your co-host for recommended reading, Amanda Dell. I'm Kimberly Chow. Welcome to this week's episode. Food Book Fair is a food media festival. We have a combination of events, including panel events, workshops, dinners, and other thematic meals based on different types and inspired by different types of food media. So that could mean books, cookbooks, of course, uh, but also food memoirs, political writing about food. We also celebrate food film, radio, television. Print is important in this ever-increasing digital world because of the experience that you get to have when you can touch a piece of media that you physically have in your hand. I think something that's really interesting to watch is the small, small print publications to see if any can make a profit because they're a really exciting space to watch. And I love the idea of 
having something that's even more niche than food. It's like like Jari, I think, is a great example of an awesome publication. I would love there to be a world where they could make money and actually sustain themselves and have that be full-time jobs for everybody. Is there a way that the online world can help them so that they can do the print magazine and also make money? When a band puts out you know, two, two great albums and then after the, the second album they break up and all you have is like what they've, this record that they've left. Now I think of like Lucky Peach as kind of being like the velvet underground of, of food magazines and they really made it cool. And all these other magazines are inspired by them, even though Lucky Peach is now no longer around, they're inspired and now they're kind of t carrying, that, carrying that torch. Thanks for listening. Please support Heritage Radio Network. It's an amazing member supported radio network coming to you live from the back of Bushwick, Brooklyn's Roberta's Pizza. I fucked that, I'm gonna start over again. <laughs>
let's talk about avocado. You know what I mean? Like everyone like that, like looks really beautiful and like you see it everywhere. I don't think that chefs like really give a fuck about avocados, but like, you know, most brunch places you go to now all have their avocado toast, you know, but cause it like looks pretty and like that, like that definitely has, I think that maybe those influencers have influenced what chefs put on their menu, if that makes sense, you know? So like, um, people are taking a lot of pictures of these avocados and avocado toast and like it looks so beautiful and they're doing a little like, you know, swirl of it or whatever. Um, and then chefs are just like, well, I got to, if I have a brunch menu, I got to put avocado on the fucking menu and everyone's going to get it and, or, you know, put an egg on it. You know what I mean? And I had someone tell me not that long ago, oh, you've got to go to this restaurant. I was like, oh, is it really that good? And they were like, I mean, not really. You can take a photo and then like, don't, don't worry about the food. And I was just like, <sighs> I was like, that makes no sense to me. There is also this movement to just overindulge. Like, I know it's shitty, I'm just gonna keep doing it. I mean, the whole bacon craze, which I don't think has even gone away. People overindulging in fatty, shitty food is a little bit of, I mean, it's, it's a little bit like Trump. We've all, in, we've all got this president and it's the opposite of what is happening in the other part of the world. So there's always gonna be that other side, like if, if, if you're giving me low calorie, you know, healthy stuff, I want the shit. Give me double that and make shit. So there's always gonna be a market for that. You'll see, you know, things that are like too big to eat and like, or really sloppy. It's the fuck you, it's the, it's the backlash against healthy. Like, don't tell me what to eat. All the poor motherfuckers who voted for Trump don't give a shit what they eat. I mean, it's the same thing. And they also, and, and, and frankly, in their defense, they can't afford the shit that we all want to eat. I did a, I took cookie dough and I made a giant cookie bowl and I made, <laughs> this is disgusting. I'm like not proud of this, but I'm also very proud of it. I made a cookie bowl, it was like huge. And then I put, I made an ice cream sundae out of that and like put like cookie crisp on top and like just like, it was like gluttonous. And people were like, that's diabetes right there. And I'm like, I don't expect you to go and eat, like make this and eat this whole thing yourself. Like if I had to put a disclaimer to be like, don't be a fat ass and like, or like unhealthy and eat this yourself. Like that's crazy. Yeah, is it satisfying to watch Mouth, uh, cheese pulls, of course it is. It's like really, it feels good. It feels like I'm about to eat that. And like you have this uh, biological, physiological reaction to it. Is it healthy? No, of course not. Yeah, exactly. Take responsibility for yourself, people. Don't eat a whole fucking cookie bowl alone. <laughs> um, obviously the farm to table movement is huge. So anywhere that has uh, access to local farms and farmers and relationships with the farmers um, is a big deal. Part of it had to do with the recession. People didn't want to go out and eat food anymore. Like then literally people stopped spending. And I think we forget, was it two, I even forget, it's 2007, 2008. People got poor really fast, 2007. All the spending, restaurants closed. It was a big recession. People were scared as shit. I think even ball jar or mason jars started selling that's when mason jars took off. People started pickling. Like literally, people were in survival mode. It was a big wake up call to make sure we knew how to use our hands. And, and this happened everywhere from artisanal, whatever shit you wanna make, to like making candles, to making pickles, to, to making food. And food is the one thing we can all do. Trends come and go, but like real, real food, um, authentic food, I, it has staying power. It's, we're always gonna come back to it, no matter what crazy, um, you know, concoctions and weird stuff people come up with and diet fads and trends. Um, when it comes down to it, we're always gonna come back to the real thing. It's funny with media because there was this big pivot to video um, and now there's kind of a calibration back away from video. And we, we've we definitely leaned into video, but kept the, the word side really strong. So we have a lot of video makers on our team and a lot of writers on our team. And I think bridging the gap between those two sides is a really interesting challenge for us. And it, it's really fun, but it's definitely a challenge. I'm a makeup artist for food. And my job is to make food look absolutely mouthwatering when you see it close up on a television commercial. Have you ever seen a burger that looks better than anything you've ever seen before? Well, this is how we do it. Basically, it's my job to make food look good for photos, video, some sort of visual media. I meet people all the time that they say, food stylist, I didn't know that was a job. But then they think about it and they're like, yeah, somebody has to make this stuff look good. Then they get this idea in their head of like, you know, somebody tweezers even as a stylist i hear those i hear those stories too where someone's like you know they're they're dipping a sesame seed in a tiny bit of elmer's glue and then like putting it on the bun like that food is it's very precise 
editorial food, especially the editorial outlets I've worked for, um, it tends to have a little bit more natural feel. Um, you know, you're gonna have the you're gonna have the sauce smear. You're gonna have some crumbs. Like I prefer like a minimalistic style, you know, which I think is more reflective of like the times we live in. Um, and, and so I, I think that food styling is more, you know, it changes and just reflects like the current time that, that we live in. My work is both food and propping. So I, I like to see um, how they relate, uh, what colors will be there, um, what textures will be present in the food, things like that. I don't want people to look at a food picture I take and think like, oh yeah, wow. She must have worked really hard on like styling that shot and taking all these different angles. Like, no, I want them to look at it and just be like, oh, that's, a, oh, that makes me hungry. Dad, like, I want to eat that. Like, moving on. Basically, the ultimate thing is, is are they gonna want to eat that? Does that look really tantalizing? Does that make somebody's mouth water? And does it make them want to make the recipe? And so I have that. Um, um, do you want to go ahead and pop the veg in? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, we speak when we tell our story, when we express ourselves, and that's what, you know, everybody wants to do. And the medium of food is very easy to, you know, to sort of do that with, uh, whether, you know, we're enjoying, a, a, you know, a lunch with friends or we're shooting for the New York Times. Food photography has changed a lot since I started. I think the Food Network had a lot to do with it. Food has become much more social, as we all know. I feel like the, the art has been influenced by the technology since digital photography. I always used to make a joke about it, and you know, when magazines were doing more in-house work, I would call it the uh, overhead by the window shot. And uh, you know, an art department would buy a couple of DSLRs and, and shoot with natural light, because not a lot of magazine people knew how to technical you know, focus or light uh, food, so overhead shots became really popular. And I used to get a little frustrated because, you know, this stuff started to become a, a trend, you know, and to me it was kind of simple and, and, you know, but but became the look and uh, and then I started to appreciate it more. Um, a lot of bloggers became influencers, you know, of food and shooting dishes that they made at home and, and so on. If you go on a stage, you're watching a ballerina perform, the spotlight's only on her. So that's kind of like how I've kind of designed all my photographs when I shoot really dark, that your focus is solely on what's happening in that scene. Everything else around you is noise. The hands were not only political, but it was also a statement to say they have a place. You know, like if you have no one you can identify with in, in traditional media, you might identify yourself in these photos. You could also see yourself cooking a lot of these dishes. And so you connect emotionally. Because uh, at the end of the day, that's what food is. It should bring people together, nourish you, and feed you, and um, let you get on through your day, honestly, without all of this other bullshit that keeps going on. I mean, the overhead is obviously like the most prevalent format for images now. I think we're just now starting to get away from that, which I mean, is quite refreshing. It, it, it took over quite a bit. And I think that has a lot to do with Instagram, is that like, you know, you have your, you have your phone, you're not really in control of your background, so you eliminate the background. You go over the top and you have this, this frame that's very easy to make look good if you sit up against the window. I think that food photography is like, um, you can have, like, it's fun to be able to be able to play with it a lot. Sometimes you can like blow it out a little bit and make it like really bright and poppy. Where at Sever, it was a bit more like, you know, refined maybe and messy, like a good messy, you know? Um, and here we can just be even like sloppy as fuck. I mean, food photography, is one of the most technical uh, types of photography there is. You have control over the entire frame. So if you make a mistake, it's on you. And I really love the way food is prepared. So I decided to showcase that through my photos of so preparation, because I think like the final stage of food is beautiful, but what gets you there is also really interesting. I just wanted to do something different. It's called punctum, right? Is like this concept of of things being a little bit, I mean, punk, it's kind of like a like a rebelliousness, right? This sort of like anti-establishment, uh, like not, yeah, non-conforming approach to, to styling. 
Is it possible in food to communicate queerness? I think it's really hard to style something and say, oh, this is gay food. Because at the end of the day, what is gay food, right? It could be the taco that someone, a straight guy made, or the taco that um, a queer woman made. The only way to do that is to put a face or a connection um, to those people and tell those stories. As a gay author, I think I have a lot of different ways I can express queerness. And I think it can come through images. It can come through, uh, you know, a picture of me and my wife on Instagram, you know, when I'm talking about a recipe that I made, you know, with her in mind. I think it can come through the head note, which is like the little introduction before the recipe. It can come through um, what I write in that head note. It can even come through the recipe title in my last book. I, I did a cake recipe. That's uh, Grace, my wife. It's her favorite cake. I didn't call it, you know, chocolate cake with raspberry jam and, you know, even though that's accurate, I, I called it Happy Wife, Happy Life Cake. And it's a fun title um, and it's memorable and all those things. But to me, it's also really important to put that out there and for me to go on social media and see people really enjoy that cake recipe, which is awesome. And to see how many people, you know, straight white guys making Happy Wife, Happy Life Cake, you know, a young, like, girl and her grandma making the cake, um, you know, whoever it is, and seeing them use the title and uh, to have it just be this normal thing. It's like, it's their birthday cake. It's their, you know, anniversary cake. It's their cake they're making because they're having friends over. And, you know, people are making this gay cake <laughs> and it's awesome and I love it. And, you know, there's all different ways we can kind of weave in our stories and, you know, share ourselves and share, you know, our, our food. and. And what's so cool about cookbooks is people make the food and it becomes their stories and their memories and their, you know, family recipe. I just, I feel like that cake goes with this little kind of like pride flag everywhere it goes, whether people know it or not. And I, I think it's really powerful. I don't really stop to think about like, oh, whoa, I did this thing. Like, I'm very much a person who's always looking towards the future and like the next thing, the next thing to do, the next move I'm gonna make. Like, I don't really stop to say, whoa, I did this thing. And so the cookbook release party was my chance to stop and just say like, whoa, I did this thing. And now like, let's celebrate it. At the same time, <laughs> I had to cater the event, right? And stress and just in, involved when in, like prepping food for 50 people or however many people were there like and that's something I haven't really done before I don't cook for that many people usually so there was like all oh, the stress and anticipation for that so I wasn't even thinking about the fact that I wrote a cookbook I was like oh my god I have to like do all this stuff because yeah the cookbook release party was awesome and like professionally I'm proud that I'm like a published author and all this stuff but really I think the thing that I will remember and that will bring a smile to my face in thinking about that evening was my mom, my mom being there for me, supporting me. So that was really, really special. Um, after the party, we came back here and opened a bottle of wine and just hung out and talked until like 1 a.m. It was great. I was inspired to put together Feed the Resistance um, really by the most recent presidential election. Um, I felt myself, like many others, f feeling a lot of things, <laughs> feeling um, anger, feeling fear, frustration. Uh, and I did what I always do, which is I turn to food. It felt very clear to me that food could be one of the answers in this time when we're all looking for answers. I approached my publisher with this idea to basically put together this small book that would have a lot in it. And I asked them to sign up for a book that was not on the schedule. Um, you know, I wanted to do it immediately. It felt like I was born from this moment in time. I asked them to say yes to over 20 contributors who they hadn't worked with um, and to just trust me. And I asked them that we give all the proceeds from the book to the ACLU. So, uh, you know, I asked them not to make any money on this and they, they jumped in. I've really never wanted to talk too much about traditional Indian food. I've always wanted to write and showcase the versatility of the culture. It shouldn't just be um, like a naan or it shouldn't just be butter chicken 
or those kind of things. What can we do more with it? How can we put it in everyday food? From the flavors to the techniques, what can we do? And so that was the premise behind the book. Um, so it's not really an Indian cookbook, even though it's inspired by flavors and traditions that I grew up with, but it's more about a book of um, my journey as an immigrant in this country. So when I came to the United States, how I connected my past with my present. My husband's from the South, so how his influences have changed the way I cook. Um, and so I wanted to tie all of that together and weave a story that people would see through recipes, but also through flavor. I started like making a proposal for Black Girl Baking back in 2000. In 16. Like the reason why I wanted to call it this and the reason uh, that I thought that I wanted it to be alive was because I was in Boston, you know, and I came to Boston and I felt really alienated. I was on, I was the only person kind of here and I was the only person in my uh, program at Boston, at Boston University. This was around the time that I saw the Black Girl Magic uh, hashtag and I felt really just empowered by that. There's just this beauty in what I am and I don't have to be this other thing. And so that's kind of the attitude that I had to take to make it through grad school. And that was the attitude that I feel like I wanted to bring to this cookbook, just like baking, you know, like there are all these rules and it's really rigid and, you know, like if you just show up, you know, and you bring your own spin to it and you're, you're, you're confident in that, or you just have fun, you know what I mean? And you get lost in the process, then that's what matters, you know? That, that's what's important, and I feel like that's really empowering, too. You almost never see somebody eating food alone, that you begin to see a lot of people gathered around the television, and they're eating Subway while they're watching football. Or you can only have a good time if you gather friends and family at Olive Garden around food. And so the, the consumption of food is associated with companionship and friendship and family. Eating together is more than just the sum of its parts. It's more than just the food you're eating and the people you're eating it with. You're creating bonds, you're creating conversation, um, you're, you're drawing together. You're, yeah, I think forging, forging those bonds between individuals and making that group stronger. You know, the family meal, you know, and sitting down to these, whether it's just a fam simple family meal or your birthday dinner, um, it's a way just kind of to bring people together and just to, to talk and hang out and laugh and bullshit a little bit. <laughs> I always put, like, people together. Um, sometimes it doesn't always work, but as I've gotten older, it gets better. And now I'm uh, really keen to just like see what what happens when like a group of people who don't know each other sit down and break bread together. Food has become such a trend, you know, more of you know amongst friends and and colleagues and uh, an experience to go out and do together. Tale as old as time, like throughout history, you know, the time to get together to either celebrate something, have big discussions, have big like coming together of the minds. So it's always, always food and drink because it's just like, what else are you gonna do? You can't just, if it's boring otherwise. It builds a community and it is your community and it's what you and your friends, you know, are gonna do together. And yeah, at this, I think at this age and at this stage in our lives, you know, it's just, that's our mode of entertainment. It is going out to eat. Breaking bread is, is such an important thing and such an easy way to, I don't know, to meet with people and to get to know other people and to have a more casual conversation with someone that it, where something could be stressful or intense, it's so much easier over dinner. And when you have a little wine, I think that makes it even easier. So I think it, it is a great way to bring people together. When you have a bunch of people sitting around a table with nothing on it, to me, that's a conference room. It's a board meeting. Uh, people are stiff. It's, you know, can I talk? Should I talk? I'm scared to talk. If you put food on that table, it becomes a meal and everything changes. Everyone's body language changes. You're interacting with people. You know, can you pass me the salt? Can you pass this? And I think if we want to move forward in any direction with any issue, whether it, uh, you know, be race or gun control or, uh, you know, women's rights, anything, you know, these are hard things to talk about and they can bring up really vulnerable personal stories. So we have to create the spaces for those conversations and meals you know, are, are 
ideal places to create that. What you put in your mouth, who you shop with, says everything about who you are. Particularly if you're a person of, in, in food media, what I say and who I interview and what I believe, it's just not me talking and writing about it. It's how I live my life. And when I say I believe in small producers and small business owners who are doing food products, I'm not saying that. You can look in my kitchen and you can see that. If you look at Pinterest, you'll see a lot of um, hands and they're usually white or lighter skin. You'll never see darker skin colored hands. I've personally never seen a lot of people of color in magazines and food media, uh, TV shows. Um, so that was something that I wanted to talk about, but through photos, do it visually. Because I had also worked in a kitchen uh, when I made a career switch from science to food. And I was working with people who came from everywhere. There were, you know, people from Mexico, there were people from India, there were people who were African-American. And you would never see them in the front of the store or in the front of a kitchen. Where were all these voices going? So I decided to do that through my photos on my blog. With queer people, for the longest time, I did not know any openly queer voices in food media. People need to identify, and if you don't identify with someone, you're constantly searching to connect and be accepted. And I think that's a problem with uh, food media in general. In most images of food and um, in ads, in cookbooks, in magazines, they're white hands. Um, you know, so I think we get all these clues in the visuals um, and in, in the design and the writing. And again, the more inclusive food media becomes, the more I think we'll see that change. Food is communicating so many things. Like it's communicating where it came from and, and, and how it was picked and you know, like, who the person who picked it and how much they were paid. And, you know, I mean, it's just like there's everything about it is political. A big thing that can come up, you know, when you're at a meal having an uncomfortable conversation, um, is sometimes you might say something wrong. Um, sometimes you might get an answer wrong. Sometimes you might say something that makes someone else in that space not feel great. And I have done that many times. Um, that has been done, you know, to me. But I think there's something very special about being a meal that allows us to also practice forgiveness um, and to say to someone, you know, actually what you just said didn't make me feel great or actually I don't think that's quite right. And not that we can't do that in other places, but I think when we have the sort of safety and comfort of a meal, we can we can talk to each other in this way that's quite real and open and that doesn't happen in other places very much. We're not always going to get it right we're probably not gonna get it right most of the time, um, but we can't keep avoiding things just for fear of getting them wrong. So I think if we create these spaces, we can, we can take some steps and we can do it together. Removal from personal stories dehumanizes people. And so to humanize people, I think breaking bread is like the excellent way to do that because what, what's more basic than eating, you know? What's more human than eating? I say it all the time. When is the last time you've had someone at your dinner table, someone in your apartment that does not look like you? If you cannot answer that question, you have to, you have to change that. Your coffee, sir. Thanks, beautiful. You're welcome. How can such a pretty wife make such bad coffee? I heard that. If you love to look at recipes, but never have time to try them, here's the perfect answer. The Hamilton Beach Cookbook Blender. The other night I decided to try an interesting Spanish dish using pork chops. Women are drastically underrepresented in food media. And for a really long time, women have done a huge amount of the work in the food industry, but most of the credit at the top of the food chain goes to men. As we sit here in the midst of the Me Too movement and as abusive behaviors in the restaurant industry and other industries are coming to light, my hope is that more positions for women will be created that are safer and fairer and better compensated. But honestly, there are already so many women chefs and business owners and farmers and boss ladies who are not being recognized. And a lot of that does come down to the media. So at HRN, we are uh, really holding ourselves accountable for covering women in the food world, and we will continue to do that until coverage of women in this space doesn't require calling out their gender. 
I think it took a little while, but you were seeing a lot of bad actors in the food industry being exposed as bad actors. The industry is notorious for being kind of a hostile workplace, especially for women. So it wasn't surprising to me that we've had all these big names take falls like John Besh and Mario Batali and Ken Friedman, and it goes on and on and on. Um, and I think there's kind of an awakening in restaurants and also in food media to realize like we should be pursuing these stories, we should be telling these stories, they're really important. And I'm hoping it forces people to start looking elsewhere for who they're building up and who they're turning into heroes. So it's not this obvious guy, like look for someone else. Yeah, there's a sort of political climate that's coming, that's coming to head with the restaurant industry. And like, it's, it's blowing up, it's on fire, so to speak. Ken Friedman, for example, was is a pretty successful restaurateur and he's accused of sexual harassment. This is like not a small issue at all. So I think these two universes are kind of colliding at the moment and it's super interesting to see uh, more females rise to power and, and raise their voice in the face of abuse uh, in all its forms, especially in the kitchen. In the YouTube industry and I guess media industry in general, people talk about how being a female on YouTube is really hard. I have to say that while yes, I've experienced like some misogynistic comments, um, I feel pretty, well, I guess lucky that like, I have a very, like an overwhelmingly supportive and positive community. And so yes, I get those comments sometimes, but they're really one-offs. And honestly, they happened way more towards the beginning when I didn't have as many viewers. And now that it's like, I think that those people don't even bother commenting something like that because they know that all of the other commenters will attack them. And that has happened. Like they will come to my defense, which is like really cool. Like, yeah, don't mess with me. My commenters got my back. Women are doing things and finally being recognized, I think, in a real way for being powerful voices in the community. And obviously, currently in 2018, we're in a very specific time where a lot is coming out about what really goes on behind the scenes in restaurants. Um, and I think that it's up to women and men to change that and change the course of treatment um, in the restaurant industry in general. You know, as a woman and working in restaurants, it was something that you kind of accepted that like, I wasn't, you know, sexually harassed in like a physical way, but I mean, people definitely like talk shit and like, there's a lot of shit talking that happens in kitchens. And as a woman, like, you know, you definitely have to like hold your own a little bit and like talk shit back. Um, you know, and you're like, you have a mouth on you and like you're, you know, this kind of stuff. And I think that um, that is also changing in, in restaurants and, you know, I think people are being a bit more aware of, you know, even like any any kind of like words that they're saying, you know, and just not um, being assholes or negative or saying like fucked up shit and like being like doing like terrible things, you know. At this point, like, yeah, give us a dollar thirty for every dollar to make up for everything else. Yeah. In the same way that people of color have also have always been a part of the food industry, women have always been a part of the food industry. You know, as in the larger society, women's voices have also been a suppressed part of the food industry. And, and so it's difficult to think of the food world and separate it from the Me Too movement. I think it's deep in it. You know, I, I think it's, it's reflective of everything that the Me Too movement represents. With food media, the way it's grown, and there are men getting more into the space, and obviously the inverse is true, that there are more women going into restaurants. Then now we're having the conversation, why is it important to celebrate women in, in test kitchens and food media and who write cookbooks? And the reality is, is I think because men are interested now. We owe it to the society that we live in to reflect accurately 
the world we live in, in the stories that we tell, in the pictures that we show. However, whatever medium we use to tell that story, it should reflect the world we live in. Because if you don't, then people are being left out of the conversation or of the story, and it's sort of you're, you're telling a lie. I think for the longest time I struggled with the content that I was saying because I didn't see myself reflected in any of the food media or any of the, of the food industry which I was a part of. I think it was it was deliberate on my part to, to show my my hands in my pictures. That thought had to occur to me because I hadn't seen it before. Food has been used um, as a tool and you know it, it has been used as a good tool in feeding people and nourishing people and it's been used in silencing people and taking away people's rights. And, you know, the story of food has to do with the way it's been used as a tool. You know, I've, I've always been the only person of color in kitchens or like the only person of color in a test kitchen. And, and I, I believe that the, you know, me being in that industry is part of my movement. and. It's part of me pushing against a society or a larger voice that says that I can't be part of that movement. In our current political climate, where it's like constant purification by fire since the 2016 presidential election cycle, I think a lot of people are asking themselves, is there meaning to the work that I'm doing? Making aspirational food and lifestyle magazine content isn't cutting it for a lot of people. Someone who I admire, who I am happy to call a fellow traveler and a friend is Julia Tertian. Julia is a gay white woman who lives in rural upstate New York, but she also recognizes the privilege of her whiteness and her education. But now she knows, too, how to continue as part of the work that she does, how to lift other people up. When you tell your story, it's an act of, of resistance. Um, it's an act of justice. It's an act of moving us closer to a more equitable food media landscape or just landscape, period. Diversity and inclusion and intersectionality in food media are the most important things right now. And I think anyone who's had the privilege of telling their stories as I have had, you know, I think we need to get out of the way and make sure that privilege is afforded to everyone. If you have a story that hasn't been told, you know, I, I know I, for one, really want to hear it. There's been a dominant narrative for such a long time, and it's, it's overlooked so many people and so many interesting stories. A lot of times in food media is about who do you know? Whose name have you dropped? And how many asses have you kissed, right? It's all about that. I realize that more and more each day, right? Uh, I would like to be able to stand on my own merit, but I even am faced, even now, that I have to drop names. I have to drop names or say, oh, such and such is a good friend, or I've had to get friends to email editors and editor in chiefs of magazines and online publications um, I've asked for meetings about fill in the blank or say, I would love a sit down. And they're like, no, I have to tell a white food friend, please review this email. What went wrong? Will you help me? They then email the editor and the editor says, okay, I will have a meeting with you now. Okay. This is the kind of things that I've had to endure in the last three to six months. And we're talking about just writing a story, right? The people that I'm speaking about and the publications that I'm talking about, if I was to drop names and say the stuff, it would be a complete total embarrassment, you know? Uh, the gatekeepers who oftentimes are perpetrating or being huge advocates of the Me Too movement of we're so diverse or we're so whatever, look at the stories we tell, but we have no black people on staff, zero. Social media is so great because it's 
kind of cut out the, the top tier people, you know what I mean? Like it's allowed people with smaller income, smaller, you know, like we don't have to have a, 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 an empire to be able to speak and to be heard. I, I love that I can see other black people making things and we can share our culture together. We can reinforce where we've come from, you know, and we can get a sense of like who we are together. You know, there's a lot of times when I'll read people's um, read people's recipes and I'm like, wow, they cook so much like me. It makes me ask questions about like, well, why do you cook this way too? You know, like why as a black person do you cook this way? Like, is that something that's a part of our culture? Like, did your grandmother teach you that? Like, there's like answers to, you know, to things that have been hidden from us, you know? And I feel like recipes give you so many clues about your past. People are gonna be more influenced to photograph their food. I think it'll just be more lifestyle-y. More lifestyle -y. Well, like more, like in every part of what you do, it will touch it. It's much more self, self-startable um, with food media these days. It's not so exclusive. You don't necessarily have to go to culinary school, um, photography school. You're always gonna find those people who are like, but I've spent 30, 40, $60,000 to go to culinary school. You know, why is this person that's just been cooking at home and has their own YouTube channel? Like, why are they getting, it's, that's just the way it is. It's, um, I think it's gonna break through those, you know, break through some of those barriers. It's not ownable. Everybody has shot the same thing. Everybody's got overhead pictures. It's the fastest, cheapest way to get anything. Everyone's got all the same services, all the same dishes, all the same everything. At some point, there's not gonna be money to sustain all those people, so it can become a hobby. Um, but to be like actually profitable businesses, there's just gonna be a weeding out. To reach the most amount of people and to be the most successful, you really have to put the most of your efforts into the medium where people are gonna be consuming it the most. That's how we serve people, is by doing what we're good at and what we love and what is important to us. And, and I think I love to make food that is inspiring, to make food that, you know, you want to eat, how we can m crave things that are better for us. I love being among a community of people who just want to do creative projects, and I want to see other people succeed in them, and we can all sort of help each other, and I feel good being a part of that. I want HRN to be the center for conversations in the food world about how the food that we eat is culturally, politically, ecologically important, um, and for us to be at the forefront of those discussions long into the future. I can only name you maybe half a handful of white gatekeepers who have advocated for me and or my black food colleagues and friends. We literally have conversations about, oh, that person is not gonna help you, oh, that person will help you, or we know that person has helped us in some kind of way. Um, but we don't still have the power to be able to say that out loud on social media, and even, I'm saying it now, and people probably are looking like this, we know that even saying it now, what that means, we'll, we'll, we'll people either don't wanna work with us, or, I don't know, you, we, we, it, there's a fear of even speaking out about it, um, what will happen. So we just suck it up, we just push it down, and we just keep it moving. I'm interested in media that's more inclusive. You know, I, I hope that the age of the single story is over. Again, we owe it to the society that we live in and that we're part of and the culture that we're part of to, to tell the stories of all the people that represent this society. And so I, I, I hope that the future holds for food media a more inclusive voice. What are they afraid of? I think it's just a, I think a lot of times it's a, it's a fear, it's a scariness that they, they have to stand up against a whole, a whole machine of saying, wait guys, look at our staff here. We're a staff of 12 and we have no black food writers. Um, I don't know what they're afraid of. I, that is a very good question. I, I don't do well at making white people comfortable when I'm talking about this. It just kind of is what it is. I think there's some other black people in food media that um, some food media people feel a little bit more comfortable with because they're not going to come out and tell them, like, great, you did one article on black folks, but 
You do all these magazines. You do a magazine every year, and you've never used a black photographer. So I don't have a problem saying that to that person, or better yet, let's go even further. I don't have to say it. Guess what I won't do? I will not buy your magazine. I will not tweet, like, open up your newsletter. I won't do any of those things. That is how my actionable things that say anything towards you. But I'm not going to be that person that still is involved in that blatant act of just is not important to me. The gatekeepers, they, in my opinion, overall, the white gatekeepers, they don't get it. There are a few that do get it, but some of the ones you think that get it, they ain't doing nothing but talking. Because there are a lot of people that are doing a lot of cool work and they never get attention, so it would be really cool to see that shift. And I think it'll only happen once you see more people um, who are minorities being in those positions that can make those decisions. You kind of want a domino effect there to see uh, where this goes. But that's a hope. Whether it'll happen in my lifetime or not is another story that I can't predict. I feel really hopeful about the role of, of food media in, um, in everything, um, and especially in, in the fight for social justice and racial justice and, and you know, rights for the LGBT community and on and on and on, because food justice won't be achieved until justice everywhere is achieved. And food is this huge umbrella and everything falls under it. Hunger for food content isn't going away. Like, I don't, I don't see Bon Appetit going anywhere. I don't see the infatuation going anywhere. I think there are these, these rising brands that are going to keep growing. And then I think ones that aren't making money or are struggling along, I don't know if they're going to survive the next 10 years. If food were to save the world, like it would have to be the full story of, of the various impacts, good and bad, that food has had. And, you know, we can start with like telling the true story of food and then maybe we could save the world.